Wow, not that I'm surprised, Chris, but it was like <laughs> just a little better than normal or something, you know? <laughs> just, uh, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, it's good to be here with you. It always is. And with all of you who are online, I, I pray that you make this your, your church home. And we have some things coming your way that are going to fix up some of the things so you can be more involved so you're not so like uh, detached like during communion and, and songs and that. And that'll be coming your way. Um, so we're in a second week of a series called What's Wrong With That Picture. We opened it with a, a message called uh, Jesus Christ Cover Star, you know, because we talked about all the different magazines that Jesus is on. And, <clears throat> and my point in last week's sermon was to say that, you know, what that does is, I, I know why, the motivation is because they, they make sales. 45% increase in sales when Jesus is on the cover of any magazine. Did you know that? I mean, that's, that's a lot. And so everybody tries to push and get him on there. But then they often I'm asked the question, like, who is Jesus in search of Jesus? And, so, and I'm okay with all that stuff. I think we should always do that kind of stuff. The problem I have is the sources they use versus the sources we're called to use, right? And so when they come up with their answers about who Jesus is, they derive them from human feelings, human reasoning, cultural values, and other sources, written sources and opinions that are outside of the Word of God. And so oftentimes you get the wrong picture of Jesus. Certainly... Um, it generally reduces, diminishes the reality of the divinity of Jesus Christ. It makes him human more like us. And though he was fully human, he was also God, and we can't forget that because we need that. And so that's why the picture of Jesus on mags, that's the wrong picture. And here is the picture God painted for us of who Jesus is. That's the picture we can trust. Well, today, we're going to be looking at some other pictures First of all, we have, have a set of three. I just want you to look at these pictures, all right? <laughs> take, a look at, take a look at this. Yeah, first picture, 11 weeks old, a baby in the womb. The second one was 30 weeks old in the womb. And the last one was 37 weeks. 37 weeks in the womb. So let me ask you what's wrong with this picture. Well, many of us, I think, would say nothing. It's really cool. It's beautiful. It's a picture of a human life at, at the beginning maturation scale, the beginning of the scale of maturing, right? You know, it's a human life still in the womb. But that, that's what it is, and it's, and it's beautiful. Some would say that. Now, others would say, well, everything's wrong with that picture. Everything's wrong, wrong with that picture because it's simply fetal tissue that we need to harvest to make some bucks. And you're just trying to confuse the issue for women. But they have a right to their own body. That's what's wrong with that picture. You know, next time somebody says to me, uh, fetal tissue, you know what I think I'm going to do? I, I was telling Leona this. <coughs> just yesterday, I said, I'm going to say to them, I told you to, Chris, I said, I I've never done this before. I'm going to say, can we just talk English for a second here? I go, what are you talking about? I said, well, fetal, that's not, that's not an English word. That's a Latin word. And, and, and it, it, you know what it means? Go, well, no. I go, I mean, small child. So I'll tell you what, you call it fetal tissue, I'm going to call it small child tissue. This is small child arm, small child leg, small child toe, small child finger, small child nostrils, small child genitalia, small child tissue. That's what it is. Now, there's some people who don't want you to know that. There's certainly one business in particular who doesn't want you to know that or believe that, and that's Planned Parenthood. I know this because I got some personal insight into the organization a number of years ago, about 12 years ago is when it started. I was invited to a meeting of pastors and church leaders in Southern California, and it was about Planned Parenthood, and they flew in David Bright, who was the executive director of, a, uh, of American Life League. And he spoke, and he had some, an inside track on a lot of, of what was going on with Planned Parenthood. I learned a lot because he presented a lot of facts. Here's the bottom line, and some of you know some of these. Uh, Planned Parenthood is the largest abortion provider in the nation. Their number one goal as a business is to get kids to have sex. That's what it is. The more sexual activity among kids and young people, the more pregnancies and STDs. The more pregnancies and STDs, the more abortions and STD treatments. 
The more abortions and STD treatments, guess what? The more money they make. So why do I say that? Well, according to Bright, and I, I've double-checked these, by the way, it's why the condom they give away free to high school students has the highest fail rate. Just last year, it was determined to be defective, by the way. It's why they send out cards during the Christmas season with the message, Choice on Earth. It's why they, they push a sex educational book to 10-year-olds titled, It's Perfectly Normal. Just last year, they published a book about same-gender marriage with the same idea in mind for kids to read. It's perfectly normal. It's why over 70% of its customer base is under 25 years old, and it's why since 1977, they have provided over 3 million abortions, over 250,000 a year in their 160 abortion facilities. Now, that was 12 years ago. Those are facts from 12 years ago. It hasn't gotten better. Not by a long shot. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, why is a pastor up there messing with a business? Well, when there are lives at stake, innocent human lives, children's lives at stake, I believe we as a church not only have a, a right but a responsibility to bring light to it. To shine the light on it for what it is. Some people say it's a civil issue. It's a political issue. It was biblical way before it was political, before it was uh, political. And it's not just a civil issue, it's a moral issue. It's a moral issue of life. And God being the creator of that, that life. So what I want to do this morning with that as the opening is, is I want to put this issue into context from God's perspective. Um, so that's what we're going to do. What does God say about life? And as we do, we're going to look at another picture. Now, this next picture we're going to look at, it's an interesting picture because you can look at it in two ways. It, you, you might, some of you might even leave here today and say, that was just too graphic, Pastor, for, for any public space, especially a church. And some of you will say, Pastor, I loved it. It was beautiful. Show it again. Because <laughs> it's just that kind of picture. It's, it's, it's kind of wrenching, actually, when you see it. It's a picture so beautiful and glorious of what some think of as fetal tissue that you just discard. Others regard it as life. Personally, I think the picture that we're going to be showing in, in just a moment is one of the most incredible pictures I've ever seen. In 1999, it was known as the picture that went around the world, and some of you have seen it. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's about a little baby boy, Samuel Armas. You can look it up, A-R-M-A-S. Samuel became famous nearly three months before he was born. Three months before he was born, became famous. When a compelling photo of his tiny hand came out of the womb as he was being operated on and wrapped around the finger of the doctor. The photo was taken while he was undergoing surgery as a small child at Vanderbilt University Medical Center to treat spina bifida. And spina bifida, it's, it's a pretty open and shut case that doctors will come to you when they know that and they'll say it's time to get an abortion. It's a pretty horrible disease. It leaves an opening in the spine that can lead to physical um, disabilities and learning disabilities. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do is, is uh, we're going to put up a picture in, in just a moment of, of Samuel. It is graphic, so you don't have to look at it if you don't want. We put it in black and white, um, but it is real. Why don't you put it up? Can you make that out? The little hand there? You know something? So what's wrong with that picture? Well, some say it's a hoax. Some say, well, if the mom was anesthetized, then the baby couldn't have done that. And others say, well, maybe so, but just being anesthetized doesn't remove all human reflexes. But I don't want you to look at that picture alone. Look at this next one. That's whose finger, whose hand was around the finger of the doctor. You see, Samuel was born on December Second, 1999, without complications, and there he is some 16 years later. So as I said earlier, today is what we call Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. 
Sanctity of human life. So many. And, and I know this is one of the toughest days of the year for many of us. It's one of the most difficult messages to put together, by the way. And it's a very difficult message to hear by anyone who has been touched directly or indirectly by a loss of a little child. Any little child. Outside the womb, inside the womb. Today I'm specifically talking about, I mean, stillborn, miscarriages. But the hurt especially comes for those who've had an abortion. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But regardless of how any of us feels about this issue, more important is what we need to know about it, okay? And that's why today we aren't focusing on the sin of abortion, but sin that Jesus died for on that cross. Today, we don't focus on the judgment of some people who get the finger pointed at them because they've had abortions. But rather, we focus on the love and forgiveness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And today, we don't explore death, but we celebrate life because God loves life. And for life is what God calls us to take a stand. To take a stand for the value of human life. You know, two of the most difficult questions that, that pastors get asked, and I had a couple of pastors in, in the last uh, service, and they came out and, and said, yeah, you're, you're right. If someone takes their life, does that mean they're not going to go to heaven? The second question is, hey, pastor, if someone, like a friend of mine, gets an abortion, does that mean they're going to be condemned to hell? You know why those questions are difficult to answer? Because you know what the answer is. It's Jesus. We have forgiveness. If you trust in him, we do have forgiveness. However, we walk this fine line, don't we? We all walk this fine line, but especially if we walk this fine line of, of, of distributing grace, God's grace for sin, but not wanting it to be perceived as permission to sin. Do you see what I'm saying? So I always answer those questions with a question. Why do you want to know? Rather than talking about those two questions, though, but just to kind of explain how difficult some of this can be, I have three other questions that I want to look at this morning briefly. The first one is framed as if coming from a woman who is pregnant and is considering an abortion. And this woman says, what choice do I have? What choice do I have? My guess is there's a few people here who have gone through that. There might even be someone here this morning watching here who's thinking this right now. What choice do I have? I see a lot of, a lot of women who get pregnant they get pregnant at an inconvenient time of life. That's the number one reason for an abortion, by the way. It is an inconvenience. Uh, you know, whenever I think about that, I, th I thank God for Mary and Joseph that they thought the inconvenience was worth it. <laughs> but women oftentimes feel like they're in shackles. You know, they're in prison. They, there's no way out. You know, I've got to make that decision because I can't destroy everybody else's life. I, I can't just create chaos in my family in the school, in my life. If that's any of you here right now, I want you to know something. Know this. Jesus Christ came to free us from thinking that way. We are not imprisoned to make the wrong choice. We have the freedom to make the right choice. We do. He says in Luke 4.18, this is Jesus talking. He's quoting the Old Testament. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. See, that's, what, that's what sin does. It enslaves us, and, and, and it, it, it imprisons us, and it makes us feel like there's only one choice, and that's to do what's wrong according to the Word of God. And Jesus is saying, no, there's always a way out. There's always choices. He gives us a choice. Here's what I call it, and, and just that song that we sang. 
I call it a choice in the voice. A choice in the voice who you listen to. Because the human voice is going to say, you know what? You're too young or you're too old. Or, or you know what? It's going to disrupt family. It's going to cause chaos. You can't afford it. It's inconvenient. It's not part of the plan. That's the human voice. If you listen to that, there you go. There's your decision. If you instead listen to God's voice, he says, trust me. I'll provide. I will. I will give you everything you need and everything your child needs for the rest of his or her life because I love your child. Because I'm the one, God says, who took that egg and that seed and said, gotcha. And I created that child for a purpose. For a purpose. If you're struggling this right now, listen to this voice. Trust him. He will provide. And I'll tell you what, one of the greatest ways he provides is through people. There are thousands of pro-life organizations around the country who are there to help you. It's amazing that the services that, that they provide, let me just list some of these, free pregnancy tests, ultrasounds, counseling, support groups, child care classes, financial education, babysitting, diapers, children's clothes, housing. See, there's choices. And there are tens of thousands of church, churches like us right here. And through the organization Lutherans for Life who donate time and money and, and food and every other kind of help that pregnant women need. Countless pro-lifers who adopt kids, they open their homes. They volunteer to help children after they're born. There are people here right now who I know who are adopting kids who were unwanted. But the mom made the choice to give birth because there was some trust there, something there. When those children in foster care are looking for a home. And there are people who have hearts for those children. Our oldest grandson is alive today because our daughter went to a pro-life pregnancy center. Praise God for that. Only question is, will you give your child a chance? Which actually frames the second question for today. It's, it's framed as if coming from a child. What chance will you give me? You see, one of the reasons that, that, that Jesus came was to open our eyes to see him for who he is. He is our Savior. He's God. He's the Messiah. He is our Savior. But what Jesus wants to open our eyes to today is what it is that's in the womb. Because the question, what is it? trumps all other considerations. All other considerations in making the choice to give the child a chance, doesn't it? What is it? And there's nothing more clear than Psalm 139 that describes what's in that womb from the moment of conception. For you created my inmost being you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. Your eyes saw my unformed body. And all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Our third question, it's framed as if coming from a woman who's already made her decision to end the life. The question is, what change can I expect? Well, I've done research on this, and so I'll read some of those things, but I'm also going to share with you that I've also talked to a lot of women, abortions, who support these statements. And not just women, but men. Men who had no choice. 
or men who condoned it, men who paid for it. Eighty-one percent report preoccupation with the child, emotional devastation. Seventy-three percent flashbacks, fifty-four percent nightmares, twenty-three percent hallucinations, depression, becoming suicidal, substance abuse. And here's something that I know as well. A desire to immediately replace the child that you aborted. Kind of to make up for it. Even though all the circumstances that caused you to make that decision to abort haven't changed. While the stats that we have are out there, it's, it's highly unlikely that any of us here hasn't been touched in some way with this issue by an abortion. Women and men, boys and girls, sisters and brothers and parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts. <laughs> it's my body. I can do what I want. I'm not hurting anybody else. Oh, really? Really? And then some of you are having trouble forgiving someone who had an abortion. Some of you are, because you lost your grandkid, or your niece, or your nephew, brother, sister. And some of you are having trouble forgiving yourself, because you feel that finger of judgment on you every time you walk into church, especially on a day like today. Every time you're reminded of what that picture is of what is in your womb. It's because you're listening to the wrong voice. And today, I encourage you to hear the voice of our Savior, Jesus himself. He said he came to release the oppressed to forgive those who have been shattered by sin. You ever been shattered by sin? There's all kinds of different sins. I call them little ones, big ones. And the reason we always say no sin is different than another is because they all send us to hell. Yeah, I get that, all right? Because, because once we sin, no matter what it is, we're not perfect. We can't be with the Holy God. Okay? That, that's how that works. But, but there are different degrees of how sin impacts the world and impacts us. And abortion shatters lives. It just does. It's so, so hard. Jesus went to that cross for all sin, by the way. I just want you to know that. Sometimes we forget that. Jesus, today is saying to those of you who are struggling with this, he wants to heal you, to mend you, to free you from any guilt and shame you may have. Because that got nailed to the cross, the same as our sin did. Don't listen to that voice. But rather, listen to the voice of Jesus. Don't listen to the voice of the people condemning you. Listen to what he says. Listen to this in Psalm 62. Your salvation and your honor depend on God, not on you. Your honor, your salvation depend on God. He is your rock and he is your refuge. Trust in that. There are a whole lot of pictures out there about life in the womb that people are going to try and shout down and say, that's wrong. But this one, take a look at this last one here. Tell me what's wrong with this picture. This picture isn't derived from human feelings or human reasoning or cultural values. It isn't derived from opinions that are written outside of God's word. This picture <laughs> is what the fetal tissue, the small child tissue, really is in the womb. It's a life. And it's a life Jesus died for on that cross just like he did for you. And today, that's what we celebrate because when we look at that cross, we see how much God loves life. And here's the fine line, though, that all of us walk in our lives when we deal with people in our lives 
people going through the situation. The fine line is showing grace for the mom who has a difficult decision to make. And showing grace to the child as well. I suggest we take a stand. And we err on the side of grace as Jesus did. And we show grace to both. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please pray with